desk here, or floor, I have to say, with uh, Chantal Berenson, Andy Palmer, and City Dawson. Um, we all are active in the Catbond space, and I think one thing that combines um, our Facts is all is the topic of ASG. We talk a lot about it, um, but we are coming from different angles, and um, I want to kick off also by also giving you a little bit the chance of, of telling the uh, the audience what I remember. Most of the people know you very well, but um, to giving you a chance to discuss a little bit and elaborate on the problems that we see in I mean when we talk about ESG, because I mean the topic today is ESG. What's next? But I think we should maybe start on what has happened in the last few years and where do we stand at the moment before we discuss how can we develop the ESG cat bond link and perception of cat bonds further. And um, yeah, maybe we can quickly make the round, uh, City, I'm starting with you, how okay. ESG topics, what implications that had and how it has changed, how you operate and how you run your business. Yeah, okay, thank you very much, Dirk. Um, you probably don't know me, I'm City Dawson, but you probably know the company I work with. Uh, I'm with LGT ILS Partners, one of the well-established Swiss-based uh, ILS managers, um, about 4 billion assets on the management. And typically, um, my bosses keep me well hidden from the public, but <laughs> when it comes to the topic of ESG, they thought it's a good idea to send me on stage because I am very closely um, working together with our investor base. So over the last few years, I have completed many, many questionnaires and due diligence um, uh, templates. And there already you can see the shift in perception of the investor base. Um, a few years ago, ESG was a very broad topic, so it was more like a tick-the-box exercise. So really, like in the form of, is ESG important to you? Yes. Okay, no more questions asked. And this has, I'm not joking, so I'm the one who completes these questionnaires, so I know what I'm talking about. And over the last years, the questions have become more precise. People really want to know um, our approach. Uh, where do we have our focus on? Do we follow a more, um, let's say, sustainability-based approach? Uh, do we have certain exclusion criteria within our underlying investments? Um, questions like that. And I think this really uh, reflects the overall trend where the, the market is going. I'm talking about the investor side of the market. And I think this is now really a good opportunity also for me to learn how the, the structuring side has experienced the, the changes over the last years. Which looks up. Which Which yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Siti. Um, so uh, good morning, Andy Palmer from Swiss Re Capital Market. So indeed, you highlighted sort of we play different parts of the market. Um, so as an arranger of cat bonds, we are dealing with sponsors uh, around the world and obviously helping them to uh, structure and place cat bonds with um, investors such, uh, such as yourselves. Um, so it's a, it's a really important topic. And we play, as, as a note, a different part of that chain. And obviously the, the, the chain starts right at the primary end and comes all the way through. And we're really seeing at least uh, me and my team are personally seeing just that, that one interaction, I suppose, between your cap bond sponsor and, and cap bond investors. Um, and it's Swiss Re more, more widely, I think it's well known. We, we've been sort of at the forefront of the, the, the sustainability discussions in the reinsurance market. And something that we've looked to do is bring that into the, um, into the ILS market as well. Um, but really, it comes back to um, sort of supporting both sides of that, of that discussion. So we have some sponsors who are very uh, prominent and active from an ESG and sustainability standpoint. They want to tell their story, and we want to support them to do that. Um, so obviously Swiss Re, I think, was the first to uh, include some detailed sustainability disclosures as part of one of its cat bond offering documents also in its sidecars as well. 
Um, and we've worked with the likes of NNRE, uh, another very prominent um, sponsor on, on this particular topic, who also really sort of has that same, um, same sort of push on the, on the sustainability side. Um, on, on the other side of things, obviously, is the investors. And we receive um, varying degrees of questions from investors. So there are questionnaires out there. Dirk, I'm sure you know, you'll, you know, if you'll mention some of, the, you know, some of the Swiss initiative at the moment. We've been receiving um, questionnaires and questions on this topic for uh, a couple of years now. Um, and we try to uh, support those investors in, in getting the question, uh, answers to those questions. But I'd say, you know, to come back to your question, Dirk, in terms of, well, where do we stand today? I think we're towards the beginning of that discussion. Um, different sponsors are on different journeys, generally, as a, as, as a company. Um, they have different access to, to different parts of the information. They're still trying to understand what sustainability more generally means for their business. And so, as, as part of that, some are able to answer those questions more fully than others, and, and we try to help that and try to push the, the dialogue along. So very early days, um, but at least heading you know, in, in the right direction on, on that front. So um, my name is Chantal Berenson. I'm with Allborn Partners. Um, we advise institutional investors. Um, so we've been talking to our clients quite a lot about ESG, and I think and, you know, putting out the questionnaires that Siti and Andy have been looking at. Um, we, we find that investors typically are at different points in their journey on thinking about ESG. They have different priorities. And, um, but it is important. We've, we've included in our reports that we provide to our investors a section on ESG, um, looking at how fund managers incorporate it into assessments and, and their portfolio and underwriting. Um, for us, the point that we're at right now, um, it seems like the important thing really has to be what the investor values, what, what's important to them, and how they're thinking about ESG. And what would be helpful to them is more data transparency around what their dollar is going going towards so transparency um, in the portfolios and then transparency from the managers as, as well and how they're able to to um, report that to the investors but we're seeing really interesting initiatives the SBAI has released a toolkit um, on responsible investing which has some interesting ideas in it uh, as we said it seems quite nascent but positive steps being taken, I think. Yeah, what, what I find, or well, my takeaway is that very much, it, it seems to be the investor side that is driving currently where the market is moving and, <clears throat> and how we approach ESG. And I think, uh, just was my personal opinion here, that it also creates danger because you ask 20 investors, you get 25 different opinions what an ESG investment is. And I apologize up front, we are not going to solve that question today. Um, as an industry, I, I, but I also think we as an industry need to think about how we can shape that perception. And you mentioned the SBA initiative, um, or um, also what is currently happening with the DSG Working Group in, in Zurich. Um, but before we go into this, how, what, how you value these uh, different initiatives, um, we should maybe also try to find out what is the most common question or the, the most set of questions that are asked by investors because I think that also depends on what clients you're talking to. And I could imagine that is very different. So what, what, what are the top, top five questions that you get? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it depends. I think the question that we are not going to settle today, what is ESG in insurance is, is, uh, is a top one. I mean, what, what should investors be looking for in the funds and the managers that they're working with? And a lot of that comes down to what is important to the investor. They have different priorities, and it's important then for them to find a manager that has a fund that meets their priorities and 
where the manager is able to express to the investor how they're meeting their priorities. I don't think, you know, taking a, a tick box exercise where you say, yes, this is an ESG fund is really enough anymore. Um, but being able to explain why that is and how you can meet an investor's priorities um, is, is, is becoming more important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe if I can bring in the, the more Swiss-focused uh, perspective here, because that's our main client base, and you obviously you have a more international set of clients. But what I experience, um, what, what is mo of most interest uh, to our investors, is what is also very on the forefront of this industry, I guess, which is the topic of climate change. So a lot of the questions that I receive, they um, circle around um, our, for, exa for example, our exposure to fossil fuel, um, manufacturing, transportation, or any of our transactions covering the insurance or the session of uh, insurance of these, um, well, let's call them problematic uh, sectors. Um, which is currently for us quite difficult to answer because very often we don't have that full look through into data. Um, so we have to take assumptions. Uh, we can assume that there is, if an insurance company has a strong focus on residential property, then they're probably not entering any oil pipelines. But the reality is not always that simple. So at least from this perspective, or tackling what is currently most uh, interesting for Swiss and also European investors, is um, getting more look through into what is actually insured. And you can also put this into a positive uh, angle. So do you insure any structures that are um, enabling the transition towards um, a, let's say a greener economy or some greener forms of energy. That would certainly help. You mentioned something that's very interesting and it goes into my, my observation currently. <coughs> when the whole idea of doing ESG investments is to steer and change the economy and how a society works by basically increasing the cost of something that is not deemed to be sustainable and decreasing the cost of that of things that are deemed to be sustainable. Although the objectives change, and I think that's an, another difficult uh, topic. But um, so far, it's, it really seems that the whole ESG question is more changing the investment industry than the investment industry is actually changing the, uh, the, the society. But that's just my just a little bit of a personal takeaway. Take um, Annie. The request for more data and more transparency, how is that going down with sponsors? You mentioned some sponsors are very upfront. What is the biggest obstacle that we currently face? Is it the availability or? Yes. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> it's simple, <laughs> short, and simple. Very short? Yes. Simply, yes. Yeah. It's the availability of, of that information. And I mean, you yourself just mentioned um, 20 different investors, 25 different opinions on what ESG is. Chantal mentioned that ESG means different things to, to different people. We get all sorts of different questions, mm -hmm. asking for different, different cases on climate, you name it. What about this? What about that? It's, it's unrealistic to be able to answer every single different cut of view. And that's why the Swish initiative is good, because we start to see some of the, the managers come together and align at least some of those questions, which helps sponsors to take a look at those. Um, but you know, in the in the structuring process, if you, if that lands on if that lands on your desk when you bring a new deal to market and you've got two weeks to to get orders in and price a deal, you're not going to get realistically you're not going to get answers to those unless they're already available. Mm -hmm. So there's always a cycle about okay, we see those, let's discuss those with potential sponsors ahead of time and see what can be done in terms of um, provi providing that information. I mean. Quite often, there's also other sort of associated challenges. You know, the, the information has to be um, checked rather carefully. It's a securities offering. 
Um, maybe the, the ultimate sponsor is a listed company. Maybe they've got a sustainability team that needs to check it. So th there's a natural time lag as well. So not just capturing the data because they may not have captured it originally, but there's also this natural time lag and, and other sort of factors in there, which means it just takes time to come through. So I, I think you're always going to see a little bit that time lag. And I think because we're, we're at the relatively early stage of the journey, we've still got some of that to go with, with many sponsors. Um, but nevertheless, I think the direction of travel, as I said earlier, is, is, the, is the right one. Um, but the quicker we can get to sort of trying to conform a little bit what are the most important things, then I think we can focus the minds of, uh, of companies in the market. Yeah, maybe it's a good time for you to talk a little bit about the, the initiative, because not everybody might be aware of what's, what's currently going on. Um, I mean, ultimately, the request from, that I hear from, uh, out of Andy's comments is that you, you're looking for standardization when we talk about ESG, instead of having a highly fragmented, opinion-driven uh, an environment that we need, need to navigate. I mean, and I think standardization might also be helpful in communicating back to our investors. Um, and then you can still, I mean, sustainable investment is not a black and white topic. It's a, it's a gray area, and uh, different clients will have different needs. Um, but yeah, maybe yeah. tell a little Definitely bit more. Definitely not black and white, more greenish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you for handing over the, the ball. So. Um, I'm here not only as a representative of LGT Islands Partners, I'm also uh, representing the working group of Swiss-based ILS managers, whose goal is to work towards greater data transparency on individual ILS transactions. Because for our investor base, it would help, it would be a great help to know um, what in terms of ESG data um, that they're getting for their money. And of course, this um, lack of standardization is a big topic. But on the other hand, it's also a big opportunity for us, us now being the, the ILS industry, to shape, to work towards so, at least some form of standardization. And there are, for example, these um, uh, the, the SDG goals, um, that is a fixed set of, of targets um, that are basically val valid for the entire world or they are applicable on a global scale. And our initiative is really working towards having, I think, what is it, 10, 10 to 15 um, data points that uh, we would like to receive uh, on individual cat bond transactions in terms of is the transaction covering fossil fuels? Is the transaction covering um, what would what be another, what, we, what would be a, a positive um, example? I'm all Wind farms or? Exactly, yeah. Is the, is the, uh, is the transaction covering renewable energies in some form? This would already be of great help. So our first step would not be, or our first goal would not be having full look through on individual values, but just like a, a binary yes or no answer. That would already help uh, shaping the view on individual transactions. In a next step, if there is a quantifiable metric that would be provided from a sponsor side, that would be awesome, <laughs> to be honest. And um, we are at the early stage where we still want to receive your feedback. So from the brokers, from the sponsors, from the structures, what would be, what would make sense? And I think some of you already received our initial communication and we would very much like to hear more feedback and also we would very much like to invite people who are interested in participating in this early stage of dialogue in shaping what ultimately could be the new standard um, for ILS transactions. We, we were very excited when we heard that 
this initiative is going on, because I, I don't know if you've noticed, but we're quite big fans of the idea of data. And um, <laughs> even if it's really? done, yeah. <laughs> and once you give us a bit, we'll always ask for more. So you know, I don't know. No. <laughs> um, so we we think it's great. I mean, even if it starts with like a yes, no, just to understand what's in the portfolio and get people used to the idea of providing more information. Um, I mean, as Andy said, like it's it's the direction of travel. That's that's really positive. So you know, if you if you want our opinion, we'd we'd be happy to give it to you. <laughs> That's already good news. <laughs> really good news. And I have to say, I mean, transparency in general should not be a bad thing. Everybody at the end of the day should benefit, not only the investors, but also um, all participants, all market participants, basically. And interestingly, um, our company or our reinsurance entity, Luminary, where we write the, our collateralized reinsurance transactions uh, through, um, they received from one of their seasons questions about how they, as the provider of reinsurance capacity, handle certain uh, ESG topics. So the flow goes in both directions. And I think it's only fair if we um, promote this flow in each possible direction. Yeah, and what I I like with the idea of co primarily collecting data instead of saying this is good, this is bad. Um, it's yeah, it, it doesn't give an opinion because um, and we had when we prepared for this panel discussion, we had a, actually quite a heated debate a little bit uh, about what can, what is ESG and I mean. As I said earlier, um, these discussions lead to nowhere at this point in time because we don't have a standard framework that we think how we should treat ESG. Um, but having the transparency enables everyone in the value chain. That's how, how I read it from from what you, from what your comments are aware to be to be able to make their own opinion and to say yes, for me, carbon or the fossil fuel is a clear exclusion. Others might see it differently, and if you have the data, you can answer this question. And it's also the experience that we have as a company. Most investors are not very strict in the way that they say, I want this and this and that excluded from a portfolio, but they want to know how you mm -hmm. treat it. Um, so, and to be able to treat it, we need, we need to have the, the information. So I think that's probably the, 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 the path where the, the industry is moving to. Um, another, another question that comes up very often is, of course, then how much impact does this industry already deliver? And uh, that links a little bit back to the panel discussion that we had heard earlier, um, where very much when you, I'm again, sharing my, my experience, where I feel that, yes, everything that is emerging market is good and everything else is bad. And I don't think that's so simple. Andy is rigorously shaking the head. Yeah. It's, it's not. I mean, I, I think as an industry, we don't do a very good job of explaining the value of insurance to wider society. And reinsurance and, and ILS is uh, obviously a sort of supporting part of the overall um, insurance industry. And you mentioned the, the emerging markets deals, you know, the deals done and sort of originated and sponsored by World Bank. Those are crucial for those countries. They're really important. And of course, they, they make a difference and look smell and feel a bit more like an impact investment in, in that sense. But the, the rest of the deals also go to support insurance. And insurance in society is so crucial. I mean, look, if you look historically about how many claims payments that there are around the world, I mean, you only need to look at results of insurance and reinsurance companies in the last four or five years. You can see the, the value, actually, that, that is being delivered. And I don't think, as on the whole, we, we sort of explain that very well to society. And if we, when you kind of think of fundamentally, you know, things don't get built without insurance. If, if someone's house doesn't get rebuilt, if they don't buy insurance on a personal level, and they lose their house, who knows where that person ends up? Do they end up on the street? Does that become a problem for society? Do they need to be supported by society? There's huge ramifications, actually. And what insurance does as a whole is really underpin a lot of the growth, the development um, that, that comes overall 
And then I think on top of that then, you know, the kinds of questions that we get, that's about refining and, and, and making sure that the direction of travel supports, say, the energy transition when it comes to climate. It supports the right way of doing things over time because obviously there are certain economies which are um, underpinned by, let's say, certain types of industry and we need to sort of help them develop away from those if they are detrimental to, to society in, in some other way. But that also, that, that takes time, right? So I think that first fundamental premise, I think, is missed. And I think we, we can all do a better job explaining that in the first instance and then within that then start to try and help steer how we, uh, how we continue to support society. I, I agree with you. But I think to make a blanket statement about the asset class almost does it a disservice to, because we could, the argument could be made with evidence if, if the data were there <laughs> to, to support it. And, um, and to say one way or another, I, I, just to play devil's advocate, you know, if, if you can ensure something that somebody might find unsavory and un, un ESG, and that, um, I wonder if that maybe bursts, bursts the bubble. Yeah, I mean, look, I, you're always going to be able to find something, mm. right? And the, the thing about ESG and sustainability is it's, it's, it's not a black and white or green and white situation. It's shades of grey. Mm. Um, you know, something which is positive from one hand. I mean, a really good example is obviously electric cars, but then the production of electric cars isn't always the most sustainable. You know, it's the, it's the, it's the common example that's, that's given. Um, so whilst we want to move society away from, you know, diesel, diesel cars, we need to think about what's the most sustainable way of getting there over time. And you can, you can come up with endless examples of these sort of contradictory elements. And the important thing is knowing then how to balance these off. And of course, this, this is, again, it's relatively new from a data standpoint and relatively new from a scientific standpoint to understand the impact of one aspect of it against the other. And as a society decide which is, you know, which is better and which is worse, that's, that's not very, very clear. And, that's, and, and, and again, that's why I sort of, you know, the blanket statement is, of course, generalizing. But in general, the insurance industry is there to try to be a force for good. There's, there's, uh, you can come up, as I say, many individual examples maybe, which, which are a bit more one way than the other, sure. But as a whole, and then we need to try and shape society and, and go with that. It's almost like it's, it's a bit complicated. <laughs> there are no easy answers yeah. <laughs> when it comes to this topic. But yeah, I think it's... Uh, we're certainly heading in the right direction. We're at a very early stage. Um, and what helps, for once, it helps, uh, especially when you mentioned the topic, uh, we should promote the benefits of the industry, or we, we should tell people more about the benefits of the industry. For once, it helps that, at least in Europe, there we get some um, regulatory tailwind. Um, there is this uh, SFDR framework that is uh, being rolled out. For a lot of people it's a huge pain because they want to know a lot and they want to have it, they want to have it backed with data. But fundamentally it's a good thing, at least from my perspective, because under this SFDR framework um, providing non-life reinsurance is recognized under this regulatory framework as being beneficial to society. So it's an economic activity that is beneficial and it's actually also enabling society with their transition towards um, adapting to a, better adapting to climate change, which definitely helps in communicating with, with clients um, of course, they make their own um, they make their own opinion, but sometimes it helps that you get this kind of official recognition from kind of a regulatory authority. It certainly doesn't hurt. Yeah, and it prevents maybe going to the market with a very easy message. Um, so simply saying, we assume that cap bonds are ESG positive. 
uh, in general. Um, it, it, at least it requires you to, to support it with some kind of data and, <coughs> and uh, not to end up with green, what we call greenwashing. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, that's, that's, that's the purpose uh, of the And regulation. I think that's, a, I mean, that's the whole purpose. It's not going to be that one fund is more ESG compliant than another. I think that will ultimately, I think what we've heard is, is probably still also in the future being something that is ultimately decided by the end investor and his use, his views, and the purpose of how he's using um, ILS. I wanted to loop back to one remark that Annie made earlier, where he said, yes, yeah, Swiss Re as a, as a company is also looking to very much into the ESG topic and how to change the business model. Do you, it's a very specific question for you. Is there any chance how we can combine the ILS market with what is undertaken by the global reinsurance market or some players? In what sense? I think there's no, uh, for me, it currently looks like a two-track approach. I mean, we have this, the various initiatives uh, happening in the, in the ILS market, and I assume there's some, something similar going on in the reinsurance industry, um, but I don't see the people really speaking to each other. And maybe that's, uh, that's the missing part. Communication, um, we have heard it earlier, is, is always important. I think um, the IIS market is currently still lives in a, a little bit in a bubble, and trying mm -hmm. to figure out how, how we as a market stand and, and, and what our place is within this whole ESG topic, and sometimes lose the big picture. Uh, yeah, I'm, so, I'm sort of not surprised, I suppose, that you end up with this slight disconnect between the two. I mean, um, Siti just mentioned SFDR, and that was one of the triggers within Europe alongside generally the ESG discussion from the, you know, the asset management industry, which drove a lot of these requests and questionnaires that have come through and found their way now into the, into the cap bond market. Obviously, the interaction on the reinsurance side with shareholders, is, 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 it's a different kind of environment in, in that sense. Um, and, and as a result, yes, whilst, of course, the likes of Swiss Re and one assumes other reinsurers and insurers receive plenty of, have plenty of discussion with investors on, on the topic. This is, this is at a different level in terms of overall mm -hmm. as opposed to individual transaction level, which is what it boils down to in, in, in the capital market. So I'm, I'm, I'm not so surprised in terms of that slight disconnect. Um, do we want to see that sort of come together? I think naturally it will. Um, if you think about the interaction between the insurers, the reinsurers, um, ILS managers, um, more of these dialogue, more discussion, you mentioned communication, I think that will naturally flow across. And I think it does go both ways. So City mentioned um, a case of a, um, a, a, a cedent asking Luma and Re about certain, certain questions. We've had discussions with a cat one sponsor who thought, should I exclude certain investors if they invest in things that I'm not massively keen on. So pushing it the other mm -hmm. way. And a bit of long discussion about whether that was healthy for the market because it's possible you end up with a bifurcated market which is not so good. And something which on the Swiss Re side I think we've always promoted and, um, and, and certainly known for is to encourage dialogue to develop that transition to help our clients to move forward productively rather than necessarily just break the market in two and have, if you like, the, the so-called good risks and bad risks, which doesn't really achieve anything and doesn't re, re, uh, achieve progression overall. So I think we will see that more and more, and it's just a case of more dialogue. Um, I think it's, it, it, you will naturally see that uh, over time. And of course, you know, the likes of Swiss Re and others, it's, it's our duty to encourage that as well. Great. I see Steve uh, <laughs> giving instructions, and I'm mindful of the time. Um, I was going to say, if there's any questions in the audience, perhaps e now's a good time. E exactly. I think that we've pre pretty much rounded up all the topics from where we come from, where we probably have maybe headed to, um, what we try to avoid, about vacation. Um, and I think that was great. It was a great discussion. Thank you all for, for your input. And um, we turn it back to the audience, whether there are additional questions to any of the panelists here. If anyone's got any questions, we do need to get a mic to you, so I'm going to end up running around the room as usual. <laughs> Hi, thanks very much, Steve. Um, I'm James from Agile Risk Advisory. Uh, we're looking at 
using a cap on structures in the facultative risk context, which enables us to get a much, much better view of risk. I can get lat long data, you know, zip code level data for everything that we're putting into the strategies. Um, so in, in the, on the theme of transparency and better data, um, does, is there anybody on, on the stage or in, in the audience that can help us to, uh, with, with introductions to new and additional risk capital? I've got a, a number of deals in the mix at the moment and we're, we're looking for more capital partners, but in, in the view of, uh, with, with ESG in mind and a key topic, and our ability to be really specific about what we target, um, there may be an opportunity there. Capital providers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do cap bonds only, so as, a, as an investment house, and so maybe I have to play the ball to city. Let's take this up over lunch. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? No other questions. We're all waiting for coffee. Okay. <laughs> then thank you very much. Okay. It was a pleasure. <laughs>